Jess, how about just saying your whole name so we can make sure we get everything right? <coughs> Jesse Antoine Marcel. Seriously? Seriously. Antoine. Antoine. Okay. And you are a physician? Correct. And what, what kind of what field of medicine do you practice? Well, I uh, specialize in ear, nose, and throat conditions, you know, tonsillitis, ear infections, you name it. Anything above the clavicle I have to do with. And you also are in the National Guard? Correct. How long have you been serving the National Guard? Uh, since 1978 or 79. Uh, Jess, I wonder if I can take you back to uh, the night that your father came home. Uh, about what, do you have an idea about what time of the night that was and what you were doing at the time? Well, I was asleep for one thing. <clears throat> I'm not, I want to say it was very early hours. It was either very late in the evening or very early in the morning uh, when he came back here. And uh, I had awakened both myself and my mother. And why did he wake you wake you both up? He had something he wanted to show us. This uh, apparently was some debris or something he brought in from the field uh, at that time. And I understand he was on his way to the air base to deliver this, but he felt that this was unusual enough that he wanted us to see it first before he delivered it to his proper destination. And what happened? Uh, what happened after he woke you up? And well, he was, uh, as I recall, very excited, and uh, again, he said, I want to show you something, and uh, uh, so I got my, my house coat on, I did my mother, and uh, he had gone out to the car and brought back in some metallic debris, I believe it was in a box. I know, uh, I don't recall whether I walked outside with him or not, but uh, he made it seem like the, the 1942 Buick we had was loaded with the stuff. Uh, in the back seat and in the trunk area. At any rate, uh, he brought the material in and spread it on the kitchen floor and uh, in an effort to try to piece it together like a jigsaw puzzle to get some idea of form of this. But unfortunately, there was too much of it, too finely divided to do that. Uh, how old were you at the time? Uh, at 11. And uh, when he spread all this material out on the floor, what was your impression about the, uh, what this what this material was like? How would you describe it? Well, initially, just looking at it, well, what's this all about? You know, sleepy. But then, when you get down into looking at it, uh, it was the unusual character of the debris. And uh, I want to say that he said something like, "This is from a flying saucer," but I'm not sure that he said that. But the meaning was clear that this is something very special he wanted us to look at. And what's your recollection about what the material looks like, felt like? Well, I could divide it into three major categories. I'm thinking back on it uh, a few times. Uh, there was a lot of rather thick foil-like material, uh, kind of a, not a uh, shiny aluminum, but uh, burnished or a uh, slate gray type of aluminum metal. Uh, there was a uh, black plastic type debris like Bakelite, which was shattered, it was very brittle material. And then there were uh, fragments of what appeared to be I-beams, uh, relatively small, but uh, the typical I-beam type configuration. Let's let's talk a little bit about each category for a, you know, a little bit of detail, if you will. Uh, let's talk about first the foil-like substance. What, uh, what sort of, what was the size of this material? Well, I don't recall seeing any piece that was greater than four to six inches in, in circumference or in diameter. Uh, I don't recall whether I, I tried to test it for being able to tear it or bend it or anything like that. It was very light and, uh, again, a, a dull metallic gray color. And uh, there was a lot of that. How thick would you describe this material? Well, it was about was thicker than the usual kind of kitchen foil. I guess there's a newer foil out now for heavy duty use that uh, is used in uh, storing food, and that's approximately what it was like. In terms of thickness? In terms of thickness. Any other similarities to, to everyday household items that people Well, would use? it's metallic, you know, that's about all I can say. Uh, not shiny. And the pieces of, of the foil like substance, uh, what shape were they? Well, it was uh, 
shredded, no, they, they you know, torn. So uh, irregular in shape? Irregular, right. And there was a lot of this material? Well, enough to cover the floor. Right? Was this... Uh, and more, because there's a lot more left in the car. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. He didn't bring in all oh, of them? Oh, no, no. It was only one portion of the, uh, the car. Okay. Um, the uh, the weight of this material you described as light, uh, would you would you say that it was unusually light, lighter than you would expect, or heavier, or anything anything at all unusual about its weight? Well, feathers. Very, very light. Very light. Okay. In other words, you could take a piece and it wouldn't just fall to the floor, but it kind of drift down fairly slow like a feather. No, that's very interesting. And, uh, Did you actually see that? I. Did you see that? No, I did not, but this is what, you know, I would have thought it would be like, you know, if I would have done that. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've tried so. Light as a feather. Interesting. The, uh, what you described as an almost plastic or bakelite like material. Tell me a little more about that. Well, it's uh, black, brown in color. Uh, again, irregular pieces. Uh, about a sixteenth of an inch, maybe a little bit greater in thickness. And uh, brittle. At least I suspect it was brittle because it shattered my glass. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make sure I understand you. You didn't actually see it shatter, no. but it <clears throat> appeared to have yeah. been shattered. Yeah, I didn't try to bend or test any of these things. So I just picked them up gently mm -hmm. and handled them. Okay. Anything else unusual what about the weight of this material? Plastic. It light. was very light also. I, you know, it's kind of hard to... I don't recall this. Comparing with other at this point. Uh, anything else uh, worthy of comment about this material? Do you recall? Mm, basically, just the description of color, uh, shatter type, bake light material. Yeah. Now, how about what you described as I beams? What, do, what were those like? Well, they were, again, looked like the same type of material that the foil like material is made of uh, metallic. Uh, Dull gray aluminum, except very light again. Uh, I did not try to bend it or stress it in any way, although the piece I remember looking at was about uh, 12 to 18 inches in length. Both ends, I think, were shattered or broken off, wasn't as clean cut. And uh, the material thickness appeared to be about a sixteenth of an inch thickness. And what color was it? Again, it's a dull gray, uh, like a flat balloon finish, I guess would be a good way to describe that. Uh, metallic? Metallic, definitely metallic. Okay. Anything else unusual about this particular piece of material? Well, the most unusual part of this whole thing was what was on the I-beam, on the inner surface of an I-beam. Because uh, as you look at it head on, there appeared to be a type of writing in the, on the mainframe itself. Uh, this writing was uh, definitely a purplish violet hue. Uh, it did have uh, an embossed appearance because you could, if I recall, you could rub your finger along it and you could tell it, it had texture. Uh, I don't recall any seeing any lines or letters of any kind, but it was more like geometric shapes. Or well, it's hard to describe it. It was a curved, curved geometric shapes. There might have been some triangles and circles, but uh, uh, it was solid. Is it possible you might have mistaken it for Russian, Japanese, any other no. language? No, no way. Anything like hieroglyphics? Well, in my in my first impression was uh, this is Egyptian hieroglyphics, but. Uh, I knew enough at that time to know that it wasn't because hieroglyphics usually have some animal symbol, symbols in it also that there was none. Um, and the, the, the lettering, or we can call it lettering, of these yeah, symbols. In, individual symbols. Uh -huh. They were not connected. Okay. Uh, were, were, were they were in color? Yeah, yes. Uh, but they were on a surface that was what? Well, the surface was the same color as the rest of the uh, dull metallic gray. So it was just the symbols that were in a kind of purple-pink. That's right. That is a color that caught your eye. Here in all this uh, massive of uh, metallic gray uh,
pieces there. Here's a uh, flash of color. What do you recall your father saying that night about how he came into possession of this material? I don't recall a whole lot of the mechanics or the logistics involved. I do know he'd been going for quite a while. I'm not sure exactly how long he'd been going, you know, but uh, the, uh, if I remember saying something about this came from a Christ site or from some village ranch or northwest, northwest of Roswell. And um, you said at the outset that he appeared to be excited. Yeah, that's the reason he got us. Why, why was he excited about this? Because he felt it was something very unusual. He felt it was probably something we'd never seen before or would never see again. And again, I want to say that he said the words flying sauce, but I cannot be sure about that. I wouldn't. I, I'm almost positive he did, but I can't recall verbatim what he said. When you said that your father had been gone for some time, or you, do you mean hours or days or well, something? Well, again, you know, my memory's kind of hazy about how long he was gone. I know he was gone. Uh, maybe more than 12 hours, maybe a day or so. And how long uh, was he at your home that night with the material on the floor? The total uh, time there was about 15 or 20 minutes. And what happened after that? He loaded it back in the car and took off. Uh, do you know where he went? Well, he was going back to the base. So that was my understanding. When did you next see him, do you recall? I think it was the next day, although I'm not actually sure about that either. And did you have any conversation with him about what had transpired since you had seen him last? Well, you know, he would... I'm trying to recall those conversations. Uh, I don't know that we had talked about it very much afterwards. Uh, the initial excitement had worn off, and then, then the whole deal kind of was put to rest. Uh, there's still a feeling like there's something very unusual about this. It was not, you know, uh, uh, something commonplace, like they would like to say, weather balloon or radar target. Your father didn't think it was a weather balloon or a radar target? Never did. Do you think it was? Well, even at that young age, I had kind of an interest in electronics and weather and things like that. And I'd seen weather balloons and I'd uh, seen pictures of radar targets. That was not one of them. Was it like anything you'd ever seen before? Uh, not really. One thing that says the park course was those I beams with the symbols. Did your father ever speculate about what it was, where it came from? We would talk about it periodically over the next several years, perhaps, and we'd always thought that it was uh, something very unusual. It would, you know, I think initially they might have thought it was even a, a, Ru a Russian weapon or some head counter. That was for the reason for the cover up or the uh, <coughs> bearing the story, but later. Uh, it was determined it was not a Russian thing, and, uh, so that left one other possibility that it was something from out of our atmosphere. Was your father in the habit of discussing his work when I mean, he was in intelligence? No, he was not. Not in the habit of discussing his work. Um, so I guess it wouldn't be real unusual for him to be rather quiet about it. Looked for him, yes. He was not given to, you know verbal diarrhea about things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but he obviously did eventually talk. Yeah, as time went on, you know, the seed had been planted in the back of our minds that there's something very unusual about this. And from time to time, you'd read about some UFO sighting in the paper, and it would trigger uh, maybe a little conversation about what this was. Knowing your father as you did, uh, what do you think motivated him to go public with this account as, as, as he did. Well, this didn't happen for years, and uh, he was a radio amateur, loved ham radio, and I don't know the exact scenario, but I can picture that maybe they were talking on ham radio, he was talking on ham radio with somebody, and maybe the discussion came up about a recent UFO sighting, and he would say, oh, by the way, I was involved with one, and I could picture that as being the mechanism that this thing came out. I don't know that to be sure, but that's 
I think, most likely way. And when journalists uh, and, and people came to ask him to, to be interviewed for this, uh, he did he? Do you think he had any reluctance? Do you know if he had any reluctance about speaking more publicly to a wider audience about this? Well, this is many years later, and uh, he'd lost track or in touch with the Air Force community. And uh, I think at that time the uniqueness had worn off a bit, where he felt less constrained to keep. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kevin, I don't have any more questions. Anything that we failed to cover uh, that's important? When your dad came home, did he ever suggest you weren't supposed to talk about it? Was there any kind of discussion about what was said at the base and let's not talk about this anymore in those first few days? I don't recall that exactly, but I think the implication was there that it's over with, don't say anything more about it, at least don't even bring it up. Did, um, after he came out with the story in 78, was there ever any contact with anyone in the Pentagon or anybody from the military suggesting that maybe he had uh, spoken out of turn? No. Going back to the first statement, too, mm -hmm. I, I never discussed this with any of my friends either. I, uh, I had a lot of friends and, uh, and acquaintances in Roswell, and I can definitely say I never even told them about what was going on. Later on, uh, you'd suggested that uh, it was in high school before you'd really ever discussed it again with your dad. Did you ever discuss it with any of your friends in high school when the stories would come out in the newspapers or suggest to anybody, well, you know, these, these things are real? I don't recall ever saying anything about it. When you'd see these stories in the newspapers, kind of what was your what was your reaction to them? Did you say, kind of, I know something more about it? or? Well, my initial reaction is maybe most of these are hoaxes and uh, maybe a misidentification of things, but I do know of one that was not a hoax or misidentification. Was it the feeling of you, your father, your mother, that it was extraterrestrial in origin? Yes. I, yeah, we, we felt it was all a very unique experience that, uh, you know, we just had to be at the right place at the right time to see things. But was your feeling that it was extraterrestrial? Yes. yes. Actually, my own personal thoughts was, you know, after we started sending satellites around, you know, the Russians in 1957 with the Sputnik, I, I felt that maybe this was a probe that happened to land on our planet from someplace else. From another planet. From another origin. When you had the debris in the kitchen, was there any odor associated with any of the debris at all that you can recall? No. Did the uh, material feel cold to the touch at all? Well, it was metallic, you know. Uh, it was a hot night, mm -hmm. so it didn't, you know, I'm sure it's the ambient air temperature or whatever that was at that time. Is there any possibility that your dad might have slipped a piece out of the box to keep for his souvenir. No possibility. He'd never think of doing something like that? Not at all. Uh, his, his background was intelligence. Was that his job all through his military career? Was he always in intelligence? Well, that in photo analysis, interpretation. Mm -hmm. Now, did um, there have been stories that he flew as a gunner? Well, as a He did man the guns, I know that. Uh, I think what happened, he was a navigator, or he, he went aloft many times to, to view the bombing runs personally, mm -hmm. you know, despite the fact they had photographs, but he'd get more information by being there on the, on the site. Mm -hmm. And I do know one time that they were uh, shot pretty badly and he uh, had to take over credit guns. He must have known how to man the 50 calibers for some reason. I know he did that. He described uh, sitting on a box of an empty box of ammo and having some slugs go between his legs through the box from a Japanese uh, firing at him. <laughs> and, and was quite excited about that, I <laughs> imagine. Uh, and other time they were uh, they were shot down. They had uh, two of the engines, four engines, shot out of the plane, and a B-29 doesn't fly very well on two. And then the third one gave up. They're going down like a rock. Did they have to bail out, or did they? They bailed out. Yes. Bailed out. So his military career, he was basically an intelligence mostly for his intelligence, uh, right. for his military career. And he would get stick time as a 
as a pilot to as much as he could, you know, the non-rated aviator type. <laughs> we know how that works. Yeah. Uh, there are many stories about his, his military career. He did not stay for the full 20. No, he did not. He got out as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, major. Uh, he was uh, given a reserve commission of a lieutenant colonel, but he was on active duty as a major. So he never served as a lieutenant colonel? He then. never served as a lieutenant colonel. I know a lot of the reserve papers he got to him was addressed to Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Marceau, but uh, he never had the, uh, the uh, privilege. The uh, Lieutenant Colonel. So he got out, he had no military pension. No. He got out of the service, went back to home in Louisiana. Uh, was a TV radio repairman or right. owned, owned a yeah, radio television and sales service. And that's what he did until he retired? And the first time you remember him really talking about this, you were in high school, said something while you were in high school? Well, about that time frame, you know, uh, because at that, at that era, you know, flying saucers were in the rage, you know, you mm -hmm. read about these reports in the papers, and the sensational magazines, and things like that, which tend to degrade the story. <laughs> as, yeah, as, as if we need that, uh, that sort of thing. But he was for the most part, pretty close-lipped about, about this, even after he was out of the military. Right. Uh, it was not a uh, really daily topic. And there was no military pension for him to protect or no threat of... No, the only thing he had for the military was uh, uh, he fell off the roof when he was repairing his ham radio antenna in Roswell, and uh, he had a fracture of the arm and elbow, and I think he had $14 a month you know, for uh, disability, you know, which is a very minor disability, <laughs> but that was, that was the only thing he got. So that uh, the, the, there was no threat they could hold over no. him, that if you talked about this, we're going to take away your pension or anything no, like no that. Do you, uh, do you remember how long, how much time he spent on active duty, how, how many years he got in? Well, I know he went in 1942. Uh, and stay till 1949 or 1950. So seven or eight years is all. And there was the story that's been published that he wrote the speech for Truman when the atomic bomb was exploded by the Soviets. Any truth to that, or he provided the intelligence information for the president? I have a vague recollection of something of that nature, but I don't know that he wrote the speech, but I do know that he was in on preparing something, you know, gathering information. Uh, it's I, part I, of his intelligence function. Right, yeah, but that was not really a subject of conversation. Mm -hmm. Did you ever notice your dad, or did your dad ever break security other than this one time when he uh, brought the material home? Although he really wasn't breaking security since it wasn't classified yet. But did your dad ever break security at all that you you can recall? Uh, one other time. And that would be when? I don't know whether one of uh, I guess it's, I hate to bring that up, but I don't know whether. Okay. But he, so, as far as you know, your dad really never broke security. Right. He never really talked to the neighbors. He never talked to friends about what he, what he was learning with his job. No, no, it was all pretty fortunate. Okay. Okay. Jess, thank you very much. I'm just going to ask you some questions just to get you started. No. Okay. Uh, Vern, tell me about your relationship with Barney Barnett. Uh, how did how did you know Barney? I first met Mr. Barnett. I was with the 333rd Bomb Group in Downhart, Texas. At that time, Mr. Barnett was living in Mascara, New Mexico. I met him in late 1943. I was on a bomb drive for the squadron commander out of Downhart, Texas. So you both were in the service together? No, we were not in the service together. He was a civilian working with uh, Civil, as a civil engineer in the state of New Mexico. And uh, what kind of relationship did the two of you have? Well, Barney didn't have any children. He'd raised a niece. He sort of took me under his thumb. 
and uh, during the visits he treated me just about like a son. Mm -hmm. So pretty close relationship. Real close relationship. Uh, I understand around 1950 he told you a story about something that had happened sometime previous. Can you relate that story to us? Yes. Mr. Burnett told me that he had, and when he was on a, coming back from one of his field trips, he'd run onto a flying saucer that had burst open and there were four beings on the ground. And that he was surveying the site at about that time as an uh, archaeological group from the University of Pennsylvania come on the site. There were about four or five people with this group. As they were just starting to look things over fairly closely, the military moved in and gave them a briefing to not, not say anything about it and to keep quiet, and it was in the national interest to get out of there. What, uh, what was his feeling about what it was that he had experienced? He had no, uh, no qualms about what it was. He said the vehicle from outer space wasn't any question. The beings on there were nothing like, not exactly like human beings. You Similar, but not exactly. How did he describe them? He described them being about three and a half to four feet tall, very slim in stature, and with a, their heads were hairless, with no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no hair, and sort of a, a pear-shaped head with the top of the head being smaller, or larger, I mean. Mm -hmm. Any other characteristics about their appearance? Only one thing that he mentioned is the hands were, were uh, not covered. They had four fingers. Well, how were they dressed? They were dressed in some type of a tight-fitting suit. It looked like a sort of a metallic, but not metal and not nylon. And it, real, it fit to the body very closely tight. But they were not wearing any headpiece at all. And I don't recall that he said anything about what they had on their feet. Were all of these beings dead when he found them? They were all dead and only a short distance from the craft. The craft burst open and they didn't, he said that they hadn't seen anybody inside, but they really hadn't had a chance to look. These were all outside the craft and could be quite close to the craft within not too many feet from the object. How did he describe the craft? Typical flying saucer. Disc shaped? Disc shaped and a pretty good size, not small. It was a uh, craft that probably could have carried quite a few beings, and it wasn't one of the little small discs at, at three quarters in this place. It was probably 100 feet big. Really? What did he, how did he describe the impact site, if, if at all? He said it had come to rest at a, sort of on a, not a high bank, but a, sort of a ridge or, or a uh, bank and had hit against the bank and had split there. But it, otherwise, it was intact. It, did he describe any other debris or wreckage besides the... There was no, according to him, there was no wreckage or debris around his craft. But what, uh, did he give any description about the archaeology team? Nothing except there was four or five people. And they were uh, obviously there for a dig, and they had uh, just come upon this just about nearly simultaneously. He just arrived there and here they come. Uh, any names of any of these individuals? He didn't have any names because the short period that they were there and by the time the army rounded them up uh, and told them to get out of there after they briefed him what and not to say and so on, he got his pick up and had it back for her in his office. Did he ever tell this story to anybody else? He went back to his office and his boss he started to tell him and the boss told him, Barney, don't tell me anything about it. I don't want to hear about it. Just forget it. And he says, when I was told that, he said, having told him, been told not to say anything. He said, and I'm not going to have people think I'm crazy. So I never told anybody else until the time he told me about it. Did he ever experience any form of harassment from the government? They were harassing him on income taxes. And I know that at one time I visited him down there in 1950, and he was really nervous. This was either the second or third time they had audited him. And I can't understand why they would audit him because he only he didn't do any outside business. He, they had it all his income from his job. What kind of man was Barney Barnett? 
Barney Barnett was a real private individual. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink. His family and himself were very private. They associated with people, but not too much on a social basis. But he was very reliable, professional man, lived a lot in the outdoors, and knew the outdoors, uh, collected arrowheads, and he and I went on arrowhead hunts, had gone on pottery digs ourselves. He uh, showed me how to rattlesnakes operate and how they struck and so So I had a, we had a lot of time together because way out there in New Mexico when you're driving around, there's miles and miles and miles, there's nothing. So we had a lot of time to talk. But in all the time I knew Barney, he never told me a story. I was never told any story of any kind about anything. So I believed anything that he would say was reliable. I could have had a lot more information, but I didn't pump him for information. At that time, I was raising a family and busy in the military and had 15 things to do. And I could have got a lot more information from him, I'm sure. But it was one of those things that you think back, we hadn't had anybody in outer space. We hadn't had anybody in the moon. If, if it had been, if we had progressed with this sort of thing, I might have been a little bit more interested in details. When he when he related this account, what did, what did you think about the story? I had no doubts about knowing his reliability. I had no doubts, but it was real. And of course, he said that he was sworn to secrecy. I was still in the Air Force, so I didn't go around blabbing this to everybody. Matter of fact, uh, I had no reason to really bring it up to anybody. The first time it was brought up is when when the doctor uh, Friedenberg was in Bemidji. He gave a lecture on UFOs had gone. And I listened to this. I thought, you know, I wonder if I should relate this to him. They're doing a study and the stuff might be important to his studies. So as a matter of fact, I thought about it. And then I left the auditorium. And it was cold out. It was late fall, I think. I walked about a half a block from there without saying anything. I thought, well, maybe it's a good policy to go back and tell him. You know, I didn't feel comfortable not doing it. So then I walked back and talked to him, and uh, a few days later, this Mr. Moore was near, and he came over to my house and interviewed me about the details that I had. Have you experienced any repercussions from having shared this? None. I haven't had anybody harass me. Everybody that watched uh, uh, Unsolved Mysteries have had nothing but good comments. Most people believe these actually exist. And uh, I don't really believe that I've had one bad comment. Or if they intentionally didn't give your address. But I had calls from every place, every province in Canada, except the eastern ones, from Florida, Texas. And the amount of people that seen this, I was amazed. So you don't have any regrets about having divulged this? I have story? no regrets about it. As a matter of fact, I could tell the same story a thousand times without changing it because I know it to be actual. I'm not about to alter anything. And I wouldn't accept one penny or one dime to make any statement because that would ruin the validity of what Mr. Barnett did. And in respect to him, I wouldn't do it. As a former military man, what, what do you think our government should do now that this story is out? I can't see any reason why whatever information they have is not released. I think any information or documents should be released because most of the public believes they exist anyhow. And I think the population now is better prepared to accept this sort of thing than they would have been in 1947, right after World War II. There probably reasons why they didn't want it released. I can't see any reason for not releasing. Okay. Anything that we've not covered that you want to talk about? Well, the only time that I had any occasion to possibly see a flying saucer in 1940, we'd moved, I was with the, 19th, or the 7th Bomb Group, 11th Bomb Squadron. We'd moved off the coast because of the uh, problems with an imminent war. So we'd moved into Salt Lake City, and we're working out of the municipal airport out there. And just about, it was between 12 and 1 o'clock, there was a disc-like object that come over Salt Lake City. It come from the east over the Wasatch Mountains. In the daytime, it looked like the moon does if you see it in the daytime. And there was two pilots that I knew out there. I can't recall their names. And myself, and we run for a B-17. 
and we immediately started, didn't uh, run the proper checks, in other words. Taxi ran out to the runway and took off, and we chased us. I mean, there was no hope, it was just distances. And it could not possibly have been another airplane or balloon because the B-17 was about as fast a thing as there was in the market at that time. It came over from the east, went right directly over the uh, airfield, and then it went west, and when we took off, then it just about went at a, oh, a real steep angle going to the northwest, went up. It kept getting smaller and smaller until it was just, just like a little dot up there. And nothing that I know of could possibly climb that fast. And this was what year? 1940. And, and because it went overseas in 1941. It was in Hawaii on the 1st December 1941. I was quite familiar with airplanes. I'd always had an interest in in aviation, and that's I went into the air. So I have an idea what they would do, and could recognize the difference between something like that. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate all your time. Well, I hope it works out good, but that's that's basically what they were pretty, pretty uh, accurate in, you know, trying to reconstruct. Mm -hmm. And they did film about 20, 30, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. But they only used portion, and they reconstructed some of the rest. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, were you, you were satisfied then with the dramatization part of it? Pretty much, but there was some details that would have changed. Uh -huh. And of course, it was impossible for them to know every detail. If I had been on their site, I could have told them some changes they could have made. Yeah. Like I mean, Barney wearing a pith helmet. Yeah, wearing the pith helmet. <laughs> Well, and another thing, he had glasses, uh -huh. because that when he opened his snake's mouth and the venom came up over his glasses, that's how I vividly remember. And I, I can picture in my mind the venom still streaming down his face and on his glasses, and it hit the glasses mostly. Uh -huh. And it was just kind of a white foam, and you know, they... Good would, thing he wore glasses, I guess, huh? But the type of individual he was, an outdoorsman. Uh -huh. He knew the Southwest, he knew the outdoors, and he was uh, a type of individual that didn't exaggerate on anything. We did a lot of things outdoors. And I know that New Mexico because I know what a vast uninhabited area that place is. Yeah. That's why the group in New Mexico is kind of laughing about some of the things I was talking about. Because uh, they know what you're talking about. <laughs> and they know exactly that I'd been through a good portion of the state and had lived there. Uh -huh. I lived in Clayton, New Mexico one time. Uh-huh. Where are you living now? Bemidji. Uh-huh. Still in Bemidji. Still in Bemidji. I put in 21 years in the United States Air Force, retired from them. I put in 30 years with the VA, just about 30 years. So? I like working. And I'm interested in things. When I visit foreign countries, other places, I see everything. Industries, what the people are doing, how they make a living. You know, I'm not one contented just to sit back and go and lay in the sun somewhere or go to the beach, whatever. Yeah. I just like to in the mainstream of things. I'm interested in what's going on in the world and out of this world, too. Uh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> Bern, could I ask you to just sign this form for me? Well, the, the officers all left, and uh, we we had some minor men. Mr. Porter, what, what were you doing in uh, Roswell, New Mexico, in July of 1947? I was a flight crew member. Uh, at the uh, Army Air Base? Right. And what was your rank? As Master Sergeant. And uh, what would normally be your duties as a uh, flight crew member? As a flight engineer. Engineer. Okay. And what's, what sort of normal activities would you engage in? Well, I took care of the engines in flight, well, and, and uh, weight and balance and fuel management. Uh -huh. And did you log in a lot of hours in, in doing this? Right. Mm -hmm. what, what craft did you usually fly, sir? It's a B-29. Uh, exclusively? Uh, yeah. Okay. Then. All right. Uh, I understand that something uh, rather unusual happened in July of 1947 at the base, and you were involved yes, in the right. flight. What what happened that day that you recall? Well, they we flew the these pieces. They told us it was a parts of a flying saucer, and we flew from Roswell to Fort Worth. Uh -huh. And it, we started out. They told us we'd be going to Wright Patterson in Ohio, uh -huh. and we got to Fort Worth and they transferred them to B-25 and, and took them on to Wright Patterson. And uh, what did and you do then? Then we returned to Roswell. Okay. 
who who do you recall was on board that B-29 when you left Roswell? Uh, Colonel Jennings was on board, and, and Colonel Barrenclaw, Major uh, Wonderlick, and uh, uh, Major Marcel was the uh, ones up front. Okay. And and who was it who told you that these these were pieces of a flying saucer? I don't remember just uh, who it was, but uh, it must have been Captain Henderson. Uh, what did you think when you heard that? Well, the last thing. First, I'd heard of a bunch of flying saucers. So it didn't really mean a whole no, lot, I guess. Huh? What, uh, what was it that was actually loaded on board that you saw? Well, we had uh, it's just packages and uh, wrapping paper. Uh -huh. And one of them was triangle shaped, about two and a half feet uh, across the bottom. And the rest were in smaller packages, uh, about shoebox size. Uh -huh. The triangle shape, is that an unusual kind of package? It seemed to be. Uh, yes. And uh, and this was uh, brown paper on the outside? Right, with tape. Uh -huh. And do you have, did you actually load this stuff? Yes, right. What what was your feeling when you... Well, picked just like I picked up an empty package. Is that right? Uh, right. Very light. Right. Uh, from, from feeling the package, did you have a sense of what it was that was underneath the brown paper wrapper? Not really. Just, just brown just paper fine. and tape, mm -hmm. but very light. Right. And uh, approximately how much of this stuff did you bring onto the B-29? Well, it's the one triangle-shaped package and about three uh, shoebox-sized packages. Oh, so it wasn't... It's not very much. Okay. Uh, if, uh, oh, I don't know, if we were to... Can, can you give me an idea about what the volume of all of this would be? Well, it's... Did you put it in the, say, a back seat of a car oh, yes. or the trunk of a car? Yes, it, it was just small packages. And, and you took a B-29? Was it necessary uh, to take a B-29? Well, that's, that was the transportation, I guess. Well, that's all you had? Right. Uh, okay. And uh, what did, what did uh, the fellows talk about on the way to... to uh, uh, there Fort wasn't Worth. much talk. Uh, I, uh, uh, they didn't talk back and forth very much. Uh, nothing about it. Uh, yeah. Much. Would that would that be unusual? Was there normally uh, a lot of conversation well, between the? Well, this wasn't crew? a regular crew, so. It, uh, how how is that? Why do you say it wasn't regular? Oh, we had uh, officers from other squadrons in the plane, and uh, the Colonel Jennings was the deputy uh, base commander, and uh, Major. Uh, Marcel's uh, intelligence officer. Would it be unusual for them to be on uh, such yes. a Yes. Oh, um, right. And you arrived at Fort Worth at Carswell? Right. And what uh, were, what were your, what happened then? Well, we parked on the front uh, line, flight line, and uh, Colonel Jennings told us to finish, we had some spark plugs to change, and uh, he said uh, as soon as we got our maintenance done and a guard was posted, we go, go eat lunch and come back then. Was so, there anything unusual about your arrival at Fort Worth? Uh, no. no. Uh, so you, you, you did your maintenance and then you went out right. to lunch? Mm -hmm. And what happened after you got back? We came back and they moved the aircraft to the back flight line. Mm -hmm. and, uh, told us that they transferred the material to a B-25 to go on to Wright Patterson and that it was a weather balloon and that was it. Mm -hmm. What did you think when you heard that? Well, I just thought this was what it was. You accepted what you were right. told? And then you flew back to Roswell? Right. Uh, was there any conversation on the way back no. about this? Huh. How about after, after this uh, episode? Was there any more? Uh, no, nothing. Was it something that just wasn't talked about, or did you feel that it well, shouldn't just, be talked about? Well, we just thought it was a weather balloon, okay. and that was it. That was it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did you have? Uh, did you have? When did when did you first share, or when were you asked about your involvement in this? After in 1979. Uh, uh, Stan Friedman called me in 1979. Uh -huh. And uh, what did you? Did you learn anything more about this than you had known before? Uh, not a whole lot, no. Uh, does it surprise you to know that uh, 
Jesse Marcel at least said that it was not a weather balloon? Well, uh, not really. Uh, I, I never thought much about that. Uh -huh. uh, after all these years, what do you think it was? Uh, it wasn't a weather balloon. <laughs> You're pretty sure of that? Right. Okay. That's because of what people say? Yes, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, you're, uh, you're out of the service yes. uh, for a while now, I guess. Uh, 26, 27 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, are, you, are you getting a pension? Yes. Uh, have you gotten any kind of harassment or anything? Uh, none at all. From having talked about this? No. Do you have any regrets about having talked about it? No. What do you think the government should do now about all this? Well, uh, I think they should let the people know what what's going on. You'd like to know, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. So we, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like to say, Mr. Porter? No. As long as we've got it all straight. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. well. Mr. Porter, can I say a little bit about yourself? Where are you living now, and what's been your profession over the past uh, few years? Well, at present, um, I and my wife reside in uh, Southern California in a small community called Spring Valley. It's uh, in the neighborhood of uh, San Diego. I think for our purposes, that's close enough. Uh -huh. And uh, I practice as a dentist uh, in that region uh, oh, from about 1952, after my release from active duty, after following the Korean police action, I think that's correctly noted. <laughs> and, uh, I met uh, Pappy Henderson uh, in the early mid 60s. To the best of my recollection, had been maybe 1962 or 63. Uh -huh. How did you happen to meet him or know him? Well, I was uh, introduced to him by a mutual friend, and uh, we were, uh, uh, of course, one of my uh, other vocations other than dentistry has been the uh, practice of, of studying uh, metallurgy, and I think that's probably what got Pappy and I together. And as the years went along, I went into other ventures. I wound up actually joining one of his because it really proved to be interesting. And I described that fully at our meeting today. And, uh, I don't know what else to say. Uh, uh, we gained a, a great deal of respect for each other. And, trusted uh, his judgment as he did mine, I guess. It just uh, was a very nice relationship that we developed. And when did he tell you about something that occurred that was very unusual in 1947? Well, it was as near as I am able to tell. It would, would have been, and I think it might have been the, perhaps the 30th uh, anniversary of that event because it was right about that time of the, in the summer of 1978. Okay. And what was it that he related to you as, as to what, what had occurred? Well, and he, of course, we will understand, we were in a public place uh, where we met frequently. And, but it, we did speak in, in quite uh, in a great deal of privacy, let's say. He told me about the Roswell incident. When that incident uh, occurred, why well, I happened to have been in a period of inactive duty in my naval service, and I was living in northern Minnesota. And I, I guess the the uh, the wire service never reached me. I was actually unaware of the Roswell incident that was casually mentioned in our newspapers. Uh, perhaps as late as a month later, who knows. 
but northern Minnesotans weren't too worried about what happened in Mexico. So, <laughs> so what, what did Pat B. Anderson tell you happened? But he said that he had an unusual job to perform while he's in his, uh, his Air Force uh, service. And, uh, that he transported wreckage and uh, bodies of the alien people to uh, Ohio. Uh -huh. It was that simple. And Jack was a man of few words, really. And in our habit, the way we uh, dealt and talked with each other, we really didn't waste much uh, time. <laughs> we said it and that's it. There's nothing more to it. Did he describe any of the wreckage to you? Uh, not really at that time. It was just a, a smashed uh, pile of, I guess, space wreckage, spacecraft garbage, and the, uh, I guess, some of the passengers there on uh, suffered uh, their death, of course. And I really uh, was more or less privileged to, to just be listening, so I, I refrained from asking a lot of questions. But he did say that these people were small and that uh, there were quite a number of them he never uh, described the actual number to me but since I've uh, of course <laughs> been filled in somewhat uh, I'm still not sure that there were what they even claim now there may have been a lot more uh, did he describe their appearance any further than saying they were small not to me uh, I think he found the uh, kind of distasteful. I was pretty well tuned into Jack's uh, feelings, you know. I, and it, if something was bothering him, uh, I, I'd be sort of aware of it very soon. Do you know what kind of craft he flew to uh, Wright Patterson? Well, as a Navy man, I wasn't too familiar with what the Army Air Corps and later Air Force uh, had. You know, uh, my experience with airplanes ended with the Taylor uh, craft and Pipers and Aranka sedans and things like that. Pre World War II, uh, things that I flew. <laughs> The rest of the <laughs> lost, but I, it was one of the B's, uh, B29, perhaps. Uh, did he did he say what his takeoff point was? Well, I assumed it was Roswell. He did not say to me where it was from. But that he did he did say that he was going to Wright Patterson. Yep, that's where he did say, and he said that the remains were there, and uh, he said very likely in a frozen state. Uh, did you Which would lead me to believe that uh, that being the case, that autopsy work was being planned and I would have undoubtedly been performed. So. Did he relate any information following this flight that would shed some light on what the wreckage or the bodies were all about? No, uh, it was perhaps uh, oh, a year later and we were meeting again under about the same circumstances, we decided to have a game of pool, and, and when uh, we had a little break in our game, why uh, he produced this uh, piece of metal for me to look at. He said, what do, what do I think of it? I said, well, it's, it's different. And I felt it, and it did feel different, and I studied it some. I was able to determine that it's uh, the metal structure was uh, different than alloys like we have in our aircraft, for instance. And of course, he did uh, uh, preface his uh, question uh, by stating this was from this uh, craft. And apparently, uh, 
I think it was a case of uh, appropriation that he acquired this, you know, uh, for future study, perhaps. Uh, at any rate, uh, I, I gave it a good, thorough looking at and decided that it was uh, uh, an alloy that we are, are not used to, or we have not, we don't think we do, but there is a possibility we may be able to uh, come up with something like it. And what do you, you base this? roundabout statement. I understand. How about, how about describing it for me? What did it look like, feel like? Well, it was a, a lustrous, uh, a gray lustrous metal that uh, resembled aluminum. It was uh, lighter in weight and much stiffer. Uh, if you're familiar with aluminum alloys like ST-37, it's a very stiff, tough aluminum. Well, this was harder and stiffer than that. Could you bend it? No. Not, and I didn't want to try, the edges were pretty sharp. And, uh, and Jack didn't want to uh, let it out of his uh, personal uh, ownership. You know. So I couldn't take it into my lab and, and do some testing on it, which I really would like to. Number one, I'd like to have found out what it would take to uh, machine it. In other words, uh, machinist language to mill it. I, that decision came on as a result of our having made a, an alloy similar to it, which uh, we're, up to this point no one's been able to uh, uh, scratch it, so to speak. But that's kind of beside the point. But I think this is one other reason that Jack uh, showed me this piece, because our association had gone on quite a few years, and he trusted me, and, uh, and I didn't tell anybody about it. Uh, I think this is my first discussion or at this, the meeting as of this day. Publicly. Mm -hmm. So. What did he do with this, with this piece of metal? He put it in his pocket, and that's the last I've seen of it. It's probably in his personal effects somewhere. His wife uh, states that uh, there's many boxes of his things uh, that she has gone through or opened or looked at. So it could be, could be that uh, that piece is there, and I'd certainly recognize it if it were. The, uh, my feeling was that. Uh, the metal itself was uh, not, it didn't have a, a crystal uh, lattice structure like uh, alloys that we make. That it was more of an amorphous form and that the, the fractures of the edges were more like fractures rather than tears. The, as I recall, they, they had a, a conchoidal appearance like uh, plate glass or, or bottle glass, for instance, would have if you break it. Smooth, concave shapes with real sharp edges. What's significant about that, if anything? Well, it indicates that it's not crystalline, which uh, may have a lot to do with uh, its physical uh, properties, perhaps in flight or resistance to, to heat. Entrance and exit. I know we're using uh, non-metallic materials like uh, osteotite to uh, coat our our uh, shuttles with, and so on, to absorb the heat. This apparently didn't need that. Interesting. So. Would would your as with your background and your knowledge of metallurgy, would you think that this was something that would have been uh, easily manufactured using technology available at the time you saw this material? Well, I don't, I don't think it had been easy for us to do, no. Uh, I think we're looking at uh, pretty high temperatures in smelling, for one thing. 
I think now uh, perhaps it would be easier. They have uh, refractories, for instance, have changed, like in furnaces or smellers. Uh, they they are able to tolerate better temperature, higher temperatures, and. Uh, well, then we have more, let's say, more uh, sophisticated uh, temperature control, things of that nature that would be needed to perfect an alloy like that. But I do think that it, it that the metal, and I, I think that should be used with the uh, quotation marks, uh, metal is, is a, a salacious uh, alloy. That's my own opinion. What does that mean to the, to the layman? Well, that it uh, it's a compound of silica with whatever the the, the main uh, constituent metal itself would be. Uh, we found some in the United States the uh, atomic weight of which appears to be somewhere uh, very close to iridium. And uh, in fact, that causes a, a considerable problem in, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the lab techs reading the, the, the plates because of the overlay of the, of the lines, the spectral lines. There's one material that was was smelted, and the button made, which uh, <coughs> proved to be a, a similar alloy. But uh, it's one we made ourselves. Yeah. It weighed a lot more, though. It was heavier. What is your own belief about what this fragment was from? Represent. Well, I think it was a, a one of the structural uh, parts, not the not the uh, thinner materials. Uh, I know that uh, Jack uh, himself. Well, he stated to me, as far as the thin materials go, that that was the lining of the crafts, and that when properly energized, it produced perfect illumination inside. That you had a total easy light with no shadows. But uh, that's why I asked today this gentleman that uh, I think it was Jesse who uh -huh. had, that had his hands on some of that thin material if he had seen it in the dark. Right. I guess he hadn't uh, or hadn't paid any attention to it. He's pretty young then anyway. So. Well, what that would be kind of interesting to uh, see if it could be. Uh, energized or polarized maybe is all it would need to be. It's hard to say. Take a little, uh, well, take a good, good old scientist, uh, maybe one of our physicist friends who could tackle that and light the place up with a piece of that, you know. It's, it's, it's barely possible. So. What, what do you think this was from, though? I mean, what, what was this? I think that was recovered. Yeah, well, I think that metal, that thin material, was different. I didn't see any of it, but from what I've seen of the pictures and so on, I, I don't think that's the same, the same metal. Is, it, is it your feeling that this was from an extraterrestrial spacecraft? Oh yes. Well, there's no question in my mind about that. Uh -huh. uh, the uh, the one craft that crashed and was as they said it was just split open. The color of it, the way it looked on that photo, is uh, about the way that piece that I had to look at looked. I'm sorry, which photo are we talking about here? Well, whether it was a drawing or a painting or a, a reconstruction, I don't really know. But we, I was here today. Uh -huh. but I saw that. So. Okay. That's more or less what it looked like. Kind Slightly of. mistreated, maybe. <laughs> you know, <laughs> by temperatures. No, no doubt in your mind, though, uh, that this was from outer space. I have no question. 
but what it was from outer space. You know? the bodies? Sure. Well, there's no reason. We don't have a franchise on the universe. You know? Yeah. I, if you're interested in my thinking on that matter, why? I don't think we have a franchise on being the only good guys and or bad guys either, for that matter, in the universe. Obviously this was something that was uh, considered to be highly secret. Pappy Anderson wouldn't, wouldn't have shared this with you right. without a foundation of trust. Right. Well, he asked me uh, to observe the uh, protocol to not mention it, which I, I did. I was kind of surprised to find that he'd taken a couple other people into his confidence. But, uh, one of which was uh, Bill, who was here today. Also, uh, there is another one that uh, we discovered. Uh, this is a, a, one of our naval helicopter pilots who is retired now and uh, was aware of, of what Pappy had seen. He was pretty choosy about who he talked to, I think. Did he express any any feelings about this, the secrecy aspect or why it was that he wanted to share this information with him? Well, Jack sense? had become ill with uh, adenocarcinoma. And uh, I would guess that he probably wanted to leave it. I, I think Bill Lounsbury exp expressed that uh, notion. You know, that I think he wanted to leave it just in case he did die, yeah. which is a worked out he did. But uh, oh, he had great hopes that uh, he would be given be given a, a ride, and it would probably would have occurred by now. It seemed like he had it sort of set up. In some way, it's beyond my uh, knowledge of his activity. But you know, you take the the case at Switzerland event and the Palladian arrivals there. In fact, all the footage that was made uh, of those spacecraft, and which incidentally I've seen the, the, some of the film on that. And it uh, greatly resembles the uh, our Channel 13, uh, if that, that's the right channel in LA, that photograph, the two that flew over uh, just uh, in, uh, it's either in Anaheim or uh, Orange. So they, they just came in and made a swooping in and out. And someone just happened to be taking some pictures and, and managed to photograph that in action. And the films proved to be uh, genuine. And those looked, for all the world, exactly like the ones in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, Pappy made a great effort to uh, apprise me of what all that Swiss thing was about. Mm -hmm. In fact, he spent quite a bit of money. Uh, on uh, books for me and things of that nature, uh, some of which uh, involved some of our own military where they were doing uh, intensive uh, study to verify the authenticity of these Swiss landings. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, I think to a man on these panels, concluded that they were real. Mm -hmm. And they, all the school children over there, I've seen pictures and movies of, of those people. Yeah, you can't have 38 kids all give you the same story, usually on anything. But on this one issue, boy, there was no question about it. Plus the description of the uh, squadron commander in that case was a lady. And she, uh, her squadron was three. She described her craft and allowed him to photograph. As far as this metal fragment's concerned, do you have any idea where it is now, today? No, I don't. I think if it, if it's uh, anywhere, it'd be in his personal effects.
It was pretty traumatic when Jack died at that time. Uh, the, her daughter's mother-in-law was in it very ill, and uh, so they just packed Sappho up out of her apartment, moved her to uh, L.A. to help take care of this old lady. So, and I think, as Sappho said, if it's anywhere, it's in some of the old boxes they haven't even opened yet. So I'm going to look into that when I return. See if I can maybe convince her to go ahead. We'd very much like to know what the result of that is. Well, well, if I get it, it'll head right straight for my safety deposit box, and then I'll get on the telephone, and I won't tell them which bank it's in. They'll <laughs> <laughs> have to kidnap me. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Crumpshaw. Well, you're you. very welcome. I, I, I'm hopeful that uh, I've strengthened well, your thinking in, in some ways. It's certainly been illuminating. Well, I. Well, if I find that metal, I'll, I'll send it back here. And I should know, uh, I think there was one gentleman, uh, maybe I can recognize this name. Somebody on our board? Oh, David Schwartzman, I bet you. Yeah. No, yeah. Uh, He's a geologist at Howard University. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I thought he'd be the one that, he seemed to be the most interested in that piece of metal and also on the smelling techniques yeah. that were developed to... I bet you know about smell. that stuff. Yeah, well, he really got a kick out of when I told him about our, our the misfiring uh, trying to cut that uh, at Johns Hopkins University. Uh -huh. I, mean, I mean, Stanford University. Uh -huh. And uh, one of our, our government facilities, I think, has a unit there, that this button that was made went to for cutting it and analysis well they couldn't cut it. And they sent it back there a few scratches and that's it. And they broke every uh, metronome metal blade they had in that lab. They gave up on it. Now this was of of what? A test of what well, we think is a similar one. Uh -huh. That was why Jack got me involved. Oh is that right? Yeah. So that's that's really and it goes way back. How'd you hear about this this test at Stanford? Well, I didn't know when I sent it to him. Oh. <laughs> See, I'm into it that far, you know. Oh. So. so you got this piece of metal or something? Yeah, I have From sure. whom? The button that went uh -huh. to Stanford. Right. I made it. Oh, oh okay. This is this is a fabricated yes. thing, not right. something. Okay. I, I want to make sure I understand that. Right. Okay. Dr. Crumshorter, can I get you to sign that for me? Sure. You can read it first if you 